Welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference Breakout Session, U.S. Diplomacy and Development, a call for Latino leaders. We are grateful to our sponsors, Catholic Relief Services and the United States Air Force, and to our partners at the United States International Development Corporation. The host for this panel is Representative Norma J. Torres, representing California's 35th Congressional District. Representative Torres serves on the House Appropriations and Rules Committees. We will also hear welcome remarks from Algeni Sargeri, the Vice President of the Office of External Affairs at the United States International Development Finance Corporation. Our moderator for today's session is Javier Vega, the Noticias Telemundo correspondent in Washington, D.C. He has covered national politics for many years has interviewed dozens of prestigious officials and representatives throughout his career. Please welcome Representative Norma Torres. Hello, I am Congresswoman Norma Torres, and I am honored to join you for this virtual conference celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, a special time to reflect on the accomplishments of our diverse Latino population. The results of the 2020 census paint a more diverse and inclusive picture of our country. Our diverse Latino population grew by 23%. We accounted for more than 50% of the nation's population growth, and we are now more than 18.7% of the population. As our nation grows more diverse, we must ensure that our diversity is reflected in those who represent us at home and abroad. Right now, the number of Latinos in diplomatic positions remain low. And as the first Guatemalan immigrant and only Central American member serving in Congress, I understand the importance of having someone with my life experience represent us in the region. My personal history gives me a unique perspective on the core issues that impact daily life, both as naturalized citizens living in the US and Central Americans struggling in the region. I know firsthand the importance that these perspectives bring when making decisions that will impact the people living in the region. This year, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I directed the State Department to host a policy conference for college students from Hispanic serving institutions. This will create opportunities to engage young Latino students and show them potential career paths in international relations. We need more diverse voices in high level positions to develop strong international relationships, implement credible policy based on real life experience and positively impact our allies around the world. It's about equity and diversity, but more than that, it is about demanding a seat at the table where choices are made with us, not for us. I am honored to be the first Guatemalan in Congress and I am heartened to know I won't be the last. Thank you to CHCI for inviting me and for ensuring that young Latinos find leadership positions, not just at the U.S. Capitol, but abroad. Have a great conference. Good afternoon. I'm Algene Zadri, Vice President of External Affairs and Head of Global Gender Equity Initiatives at DSC, the United States International Development Finance Corporation. I am honored to join you today during Hispanic Heritage Month to recognize the countless contributions Hispanic and Latino Americans have made to our country and to our government. Thank you to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus for more than 40 years of leadership in elevating the voices of Hispanic Americans around the country. DFC is the United States government's development finance institution, an agency that works 
to mobilize private investment in developing countries around the world. Because of the global nature of this work, we know it is critical to build a diverse team where everyone can express their opinions and has an opportunity to advance. Latin America is not only a core focus for GFC, it's our closest US neighbor and represents the largest share of our global portfolio. As we work to support investments that will empower the people of Latin America, we know we will be more effective if we build a diverse team within the agency. This issue is very personal to me. I came to the United States as a young child, a political asylee from Liberia. Through my lived experience as an immigrant, a woman, a person of color, who worked in policymaking in Congress, and now in the Biden-Harris administration, I know firsthand just how much representation matters. I am proud to serve in this administration, which has made equity and inclusion a top priority. At DFC, we are striving to make diversity and equity central to our agency's culture. To that end, we've launched an equity working group at DFC to prioritize building a diverse workforce. We're also working to hire a chief diversity and inclusion officer. And we are introducing training on implicit bias. Moreover, we are creating a mentorship program that will advance professional growth for our junior staff. We're also working to broaden our recruitment process, especially for junior staff, to build a talent pipeline whose experiences reflect the diversity of our country. Finally, we are expanding outreach to diaspora networks and minority-owned businesses across the United States to help diversify our talent, our client base and incorporate different perspectives on the development projects we support around the world. As young leaders, your voices and lived experiences are critical. We depend on your support and your input as we work to build a workforce that represents the diversity of the United States and of the markets we serve around the world. DFC highly values its relationship with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, and we look forward to our ongoing collaboration. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Javier Vega. I'm one of Telemundo's national correspondents here in Washington, D.C. It's a pleasure for me and honor to be part of this very important discussion, a very important conversation, titled this time, U.S. Diplomacy and Development, a Call for Latino Leaders. Thank you, Representative Torres, for your remarks. Thank you, Jen Sejeri, also for your remarks. And of course, uh, we're thanking our sponsors, Catholic Relief Services and the United States Air Force. And of course, thank you to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for creating a platform and this space to discuss very important topic. Important because the face of America is more and more diverse, but only 6% and only 3% respectively of the employees in the United States State Department and USAID identify themselves as Latino or Hispanic. So we question ourselves, why is our diversity a strength in the international arena? And how can we build a pipeline of Latino talent in the international relations? So we want to hear from you starting now. You can participate with your questions through the chat box you have there. And also you can tweet your questions using our hashtag this day, which is hashtag CHCIHHM21. So that's, that stands for Hispanic Heritage Month 21, C-H-C-I-H-H-M 21. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our expert panelists. First of all, Ambassador Peter Romero. He was a U.S. diplomat for 24 years. His most recent positions include U.S. Ambassador to Ecuador and Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. He currently produces and co-hosts 
a very popular podcast called American Diplomat, and he's a very active speaker on topics about diversity and inclusion. So we welcome him, Ambassador Peter Romero. Thank you, Ambassador. Now let's welcome Heidi Serving Baez. Most recently managed the political economic section in the U.S. Consulate in Monterrey, Mexico, focusing on issues ranging from human rights to labor and security. She will be joining the Office of Monetary Affairs in Washington as the Senior Advisor on Anti-Bribery and Fiscal Transparency. Good afternoon, Haiti. Buenos días, buenas tardes. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Buenas tardes. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> Later, we will see also a short video from our third panelist, Aide Diaz. She's uh, the country representative for Catholic Relief Services in Honduras and all the Caribbean zone. She leads a 50, $15 million portfolio focused on providing education, peace building, agriculture, and water programs to help over half a million families. So as you can see, a very promising panel. So let's begin. And we have already our two panelists there on the screen. So I would like to ask you both, uh, Ambassador, and Haiti about your careers, about your experiences. But first, in a broad way, two concepts, diversity and diplomacy. Should they go hand in hand? Yes or no? And why? Well, thank you, Javier. A very poignant question, particularly for this uh, month of uh, Hispanic heritage. Uh, I believe it does. As I have in the State Department when there have been all homogeneous uh, white men in the room, and I've been in the same kinds of meetings over, over a 25-year period where there's been more diversity, women, people of color, etc., in the room. And I have to tell you that the better decisions that I have seen coming out of policy discussions have been with a diverse group of people. Unfortunately, when I left the Foreign Service uh, uh, after 25 years, there were fewer Hispanics in the Foreign Service than, uh, than there was when I started in 1977. So all I can say is, uh, if there are people out there, I'd like to give a shout out to all of, all of you. Better decisions are made. You deserve to be at the table. Uh, and if you've got any questions about what this work is like, check my uh, podcast out, American uh, Diplomat. So for uh, Haiti, the same question, <laughs> diversity, diplomacy, what do you think about it? Javier, I couldn't agree more with the ambassador. Obviously, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of studies out there that demonstrate that diversity strengthens decision-making, promotes innovation, and brings really you know, critical perspectives that we need on the global stage. And it's to our own detriment, I think, if we don't promote diversity in foreign policy affairs and really look at closely at the table and who's sitting at the, at the very top. And currently, when you look at, at the high echelons of foreign affairs, it's very white, pale, <laughs> male. Um, so I think we have a lot of work ahead of us, but, but there are some positive developments. Okay, so we'll be talking about that, how to improve, how to change. But let us uh, know more about you, uh, Ambassador, about you, Haiti. Uh, how did you get into international work? Wow, how, and w how was your personal experience? How, how has it been like, Ambassador? Well, thank you, Javier. My experience was a good one. Uh, that didn't mean that I wasn't confronted with obstacles. Uh, when I took the Foreign Service oral examination uh, and writing sample, I was told afterwards, uh, congratulations, you passed. And uh, by the way, you write well for a Hispanic. This was uh, a Foreign Service officer who... Uh, there were always things that were that got in the way with respect to being a Hispanic. But the thing about the Foreign Service that I like the most is your jobs change every two to three years. It is a highly competitive workplace. Uh, and kudos go to people who master their, their brief and their subject and the expertise. Uh, and you get promoted by taking those kind of jobs which are out there and critical in nature to foreign policy. Now, whether it be Afghanistan or Iraq or, uh, or, or China specialists, but you master your brief and there is no denying the fact that people are going to come 
come on your door for better assignments, higher ranking assignments, once you dig down and you decide that you are going to compete. I come from a family that um, was very much into uh, work in the public sector. My mother and father always taught me that whatever job you do, you do the best job that you can. And when you leave it, you leave it better than you found it. I went to a Catholic boys high school and the motto, the tagline of the school was toward a better world. Uh, and I just oriented myself towards uh, towards public service. And I was always um, just fascinated by the role of a diplomat and what overseas and the honor it is to serve America overseas. It is truly an honor. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got to get off the bench. Um, talking about the younger generation, get off the bench, don't wait for it to be perfect, get rid of the wokeism, jump in there, compete, struggle, make it better. Only way we're, we're gonna make an inroad. In, in any bureaucracy, people are not gonna give up power. They're gonna cede power because they have no other choice. They have to bow to your expertise and bow to your perseverance. Uh, and that's, that's my message to the younger generation. Get in there and fight uh, for what's right. And, diversity is what's right. Thank you, Ambassador Haiti. What about you? How did you get into international work? Uh, how has been your experience? And Ambassador um, Romero was telling us about this uh, episode when he got this uh, comment uh, from an officer saying, well, you write well for a Hispanic. Did you get any sort of discrimination um, when you were working? What can you um, tell us, Haiti? So mine was a very windy road uh, as an immigrant to the United States, uh, not now a naturalized citizen. My first passion was education. I was actually looking at um, working in the Department of Education. But um, when I was a CHCI fellow, that's actually what I did to try and really figure out you know, what I wanted to do. And I realized that I gravitated towards international affairs. And so I sort of decided to move in that direction. Um, and I've enjoyed it since. There are Definitely lots of personal challenges living as a woman overseas and abroad um, as a Latina in the department. Um, but it, it's not to say that I, I don't love it. And I think if you really enjoy foreign affairs, you shouldn't shy away from the challenge. It is a lifestyle, especially for the Foreign Service specifically. There's lots of other international affairs work that maybe doesn't um, have you overseas quite, quite like this. Um, but for me, I think um, it's been a really great experience. I, I, as a light-skinned Latina, you know, most people are like, don't know what I am. They ask, what are you? Which <laughs> It's its own question. Um, but I tend to blend in. I was serving in Jordan and, you know, they would ask me directions on how to get somewhere um, in Arabic. And I don't speak Arabic. Um, I learned just enough to survive uh, for that particular post. But so every country has its, its, its challenges. And I've noticed that for me, I, I tend to blend in, whether it's been in um, Pakistan, which was my first post, or in Mexico, where I really did identify personally, um, having served there and in, 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 in my most recent tour. So it's been um, challenging in different ways. I think in the department um, internally, um, you know, there are, there are structural biases um, against women specifically and, and minorities that I think we've yet to address that I think um, that's, that's pervasive, but um, it's a sort of a low level stress that you feel. I wouldn't say that I've had anything quite, quite as blunt um, in terms of an, an experience, but it's certainly always something in the background. Uh, Heidi, let, let me stay with you. Um, you were born in Mexico, then you got the opportunity to serve there in Monterrey. Uh, there's a quote from Mari Carmen Aponte, she's a Puerto Rican diplomat, that says, I was taken seriously in the region because I understand the culture and speak the language based on your experience. Do you agree? Very much so. I actually specifically chose to wait to serve in Mexico until I was a bit more senior in my career, at least, at least not entry level, because I didn't want to be pigeonholed to be working in Latin America. Um, so it was an honor to be able to come back and sort of do a full circle for me to, to represent the United States and Mexico. Uh, and there was definitely sort of that nuanced um, ability, that ability to develop relationships in a different way as, as a Mexican, as somebody who was born there and, and develop the kinds of 
relationships that um, I think were beneficial for both Mexico and the United States and to be able to connect with people uh, in the public sector, the private sector um, in, a, in a different way, in a deeper way, I think, than probably um, somebody who was not uh, originally from Latin America. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Ambassador, can Latino diplomats improve the U.S. relations with Latin American countries? And what about other regions? Uh, let me ask you, what's the added value of Latino diplomats in the foreign service? Uh, excellent, Javier. And um, let me just mention that when I came into this and when I was serving its ranks of the foreign service, uh, um, there was a lot of pushback and uh, pressure prejudice uh, foreign diplomats, particularly Latin American diplomats. Because, uh, they viewed me as being a, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, they were looking for the, for the blonde guy who's standing behind me. Uh, and it, it, it became uh, evident to them that they're going to have to deal with me. I'm the representative. I've been chosen by the Secretary of State. I think that the podcasts that I have now, the episodes that I have now, women and uh, 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 officers of color uh, and LGBTQ people, uh, all of them say the same thing. And that is they get over it because they realize that you are the chosen representative of the United States government. I talked to Wehrman, uh, who was the only woman in the nuclear proliferation talks with the Iranians. And she said at first they were taken aback because their culture does not have a lot of or any professional women in that kind of, of setting. Uh, but they realized early on that she's the, she's, she's the representative. And if they want to get anything done, they've got to deal with her. And so that's kind of where the world has been going. Uh, certainly there's a little bit of surprise maybe and pushback. Uh, Julie Chung who was acting assistant secretary in my old bureau, Western Hemisphere Bureau, was sitting next to a, uh, a North Korean general. And uh, they were talking about North Korean nuclear issues. She was part of the U.S. delegation. And uh, throughout this whole couple of days session, this general kept looking at her. And when she spoke, was confounded by her and then came up to her afterwards and says to her, sister, What's your, where are you from? And she said, well, I was born in the United States, but my, my people, my mother, my grandfather, my grandparents are from, from your country, from Northern Korea. And this, and I just had to think if there was anything that could not have been more eloquent in terms of teaching this Korean, this, this grizzled North Korean general about what America is all about is to basically tell that person that she a grandparent of an original inhabitant and citizen of North Korea was back as an American diplomat representing America at that same table. There's nothing better as far as I'm concerned uh, and uh, in terms of U.S. diplomacy. Uh, Heidi, would you like to comment on this? Um, Latino diplomacy, uh, our added value, what do you think? No, I think the I, I agree. The workforce is really our most strategic asset. I think in in foreign affairs, um, when you really look at at what we bring to the table, the United States um, is United States diversity is its biggest asset, and I don't think we take advantage of it enough um, in in current policy um, foreign policy. Uh, now, uh, Ambassador, the ambassadorial. Uh, confirmations have been really kind of slow this administration uh, but one statistic from the last administration 64 percent of President Trump's nominees were non-hispanic white males that's usually as you were telling the face of America so can this change especially considering that it's a decision that comes from the president Yes, I think it can. And I think uh, President Biden is committed to greater diversity, not just at the intake and mid-levels of the Foreign Service, but also these kind of plum, high-ranking jobs, whether they be assistant secretary, deputy assistant secretaries, uh, ambassadors, uh, ships, etc. Unfortunately, the Biden administration has been very slow off the mark uh, to nominate people. But the, the key bottleneck now are people like uh, uh, Hawley, Josh Hawley, and uh, 
Senator Ted Cruz, who are holding up uh, 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 all of the um, uh, the candidates and refusing to hold meetings over uh, a sets of other issues that have nothing to do with the qualifications of uh, uh, of of our candidates. And you'll see a lot of women, uh, a lot of people, Hispanics, in that that uh, nomination process if it was permitted to go ahead. And I think it's an absolute shame that somebody like Senator Ted Cruz is putting his own venality and, 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 and personal interests ahead of moving ahead with greater diversity in the Foreign Service, in our nominations, and getting these moved out. It's all a result of the filibuster and the process of uh, advice and consent that's written into the Constitution that gives a senator, one senator or two senators, the ability to shut everything down. And it's something that has to be fixed. It is outrageous. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, Heidi, um, I was uh, I was telling at the beginning this uh, statistics the one particularly about the State Department that said that six only six percent of the employees in the State Department identify themselves as Hispanic or Latino. Now, knowing how the department functions uh, in terms of diversity, do you see any changes in the department throughout the years? Um. Certainly, I think um, obviously the statistics are pretty dismal, but I've certainly seen a lot of the affinity groups are much more active. Their voices are being heard both within the department as a whole in terms of attracting wider membership, but also in having um, leadership listen to their concerns and, and what recommendations they're making. And I think they're a key source of, of information for looking at what the department can do specifically. Um, we also recently appointed a chief diversity officer uh, which I think will be really important in looking ahead and making more strategic recommendations that can be implemented and address some of the structural issues, I think, within within um, the department as a whole. Um, and in general, I think we're really good as a department in attracting minorities and, and our issues in retaining them. Um, and so why, that's why I think addressing some of the structural issues, whether it's in, our, in the way, you know, we bid on jobs or our evaluations, um, or just even our cultural norms um, that would really help retain people and help um, sort of nurture the kind of talent we're, we're seeking at the top um, to, to push them up. So I think there are some positive developments that will just unfortunately take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but the kind of change we really need, not just from the top down, but also from the bottom up in order to really see something um, uh, really, you know, bigger changes that um, we've seen over the last decade that take time. Um, I will go back to uh, this issue about retaining the talent just in, in some minutes, but let's just speak of how we can change the current situation. How can we improve in the numbers of Hispanics in the foreign service? Uh, first of all, let me remember the audience. All of you who are watching through the live stream, you can participate with your questions right now through the chat box, and we'll be reading those questions to our panelists who will be very happy to answer them in just some minutes. So uh, how do we interest younger Latinos in diplomacy, in international issues? What about education? What about UN models? internships in the State Department, maybe programs in certain uh, high schools. I'm just thinking out loud. Um, please uh, help me, Ambassador, help me, Haiti, to, to brainstorm here and have some good ideas about how do we interest, interest the new generation. Uh, those are all good questions. And uh, how do we interest the, the, the next generation of our foreign policy leaders? Uh, is a you know multifaceted kind of uh, kind of uh, moving to in that uh, we need to get paid internships because a lot of our, our our young people can't afford to take unpaid internships at state they're working at that uh, we need to go out to uh, predominantly Hispanic colleges and universities they're working at that at state. Uh, we need people uh, who come into the ranks. We have special programs uh, for women and minorities uh, in uh, the State Department, the Wrangell, Pickering, and Payne Fellowships, Payne for AID. 
Uh, and uh, I think probably more than anything else, it, in this period of very unemployment, Lots of people have options, and you can go work and make a lot of money doing other things. You can you can have more of a a family lifestyle, if you will. You can work remotely, but I would have to say that I uh, I've done a lot of different kinds of work. I taught right out of graduate school. I went to service. I went up to New York and did investment banking. I taught at Georgetown at the uh, School of Foreign Service, and now I do this podcast. And I have to say that probably the greatest satisfaction I ever got was working in the Foreign Service, representing our country. And I would appeal to to think about the Foreign Service. It is the only game in town. You will love every minute of it if you're the kind of person that enjoys change and challenge. And uh, you're not sunk into usually, you know, the kind of uh, um, to keep you in the same place for years and, and decades, et cetera. You change jobs all the time. It's always an, uh, a challenge. And uh, to represent America overseas is a unique privilege. It's a, it's a, um, we can feel the passion you, you feel for you, <laughs> Ambassador. And we hope that the young uh, Latino leaders uh, uh, listening to this also feel uh, that passion. Haiti, what, what are you? What are your ideas to interest uh, the young Latinos, our future diplomats? <laughs> um, I think uh, we have to continue supporting the programs that currently exist. I'm a Pickering Fellow, so I came into the department through the Pickering Fellowship Program, uh, which was amazing. Um, getting um, grad school paid for and then entering the department, you still take all the tests um, to get into the department. Um, but I think there's, you know, some, there used to be a little bit of stigmatization within the department saying like, oh, you got in, um, you know, without taking the test, which isn't true. So I think the department has done some work and, and the fellows themselves as well and speaking out about, you know, that we, we got in just the same as everybody else. But these programs are fantastic and I hope they continue to be supported as the ambassador mentioned. There's, there's lots of um, internship and various fellowship programs that people can take advantage of. And a lot of this is also, um, and an interest in this kind of, of leader of type of um, excuse me lifestyle. Um, if you love traveling, if you love meeting new people, if you love talking about sort of what the United States is doing and how it can do it better with other cultures and and getting immersed in that, this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, and and I love being in the Foreign Service. Um, you know, <laughs> um, the moves get hard, I think, but um, you know, it's also sort of a, a double edged sword that um, it, it's great to move every couple of years. It's also really hard to move every couple of years. Um, but there's just so many different types of jobs to do with the department, you know, whether you want to do a little bit more of the financial aspect or the foreign policy. Um, there's a little bit for everybody. Um, and it's a it's a great team that you work with. Uh, in general, fantastic colleagues, I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, and happy to speak to people and a lot of it's um, educating yourself about what what it entails and there's certainly resources out there. I think um, the, the department has been reaching out to uh, more universities, um, HBCUs, and, and sort of where sort of more diverse populations exist to be able to reach out to them. We also have diplomats in residence um, at un various universities across uh, the country that are a great resource um, for, for people to talk to at, at their campuses or at regionally. Um, we're also seeing more young diplomats in residence. I think traditionally it used to be sort of former ambassador levels and realize that um, you sort of need uh, people who are also young and, and in those positions to be able to recruit. You need a diverse sort of pool of, of folks that people can reach out to. So those have been great. Um, and I think in the virtual world, uh, it's become even more accessible to reach out to folks. So definitely encourage everybody um, to, to have that at your fingertips and to use it. Okay, so now it's time to hear from our third panelist. Uh, but I will leave one question that we will answer it when, when we come back, which is about retaining. So if the recruitment works, then how do we retain the talent? But we will answer that in just some minutes. Uh, Aide Diaz. Aide Diaz is our third panelist and country representative for Catholic Relief Services in Honduras and the Caribbean. Uh, she had an unavoidable conflict come up and she could not be with us today, but we sent her some questions, just like the questions we're doing here. And these are the answers. Just uh, let's welcome Aide. 
Thank you, Javier, and thank you to the CHCI community for this opportunity to join all of you and share my experiences as a Latina working in international development. I'm sorry I cannot be with this panel live today due to an important field visit scheduled by USAID and the US Embassy in Honduras. However, I want to share with you my experience. Like many Latinos and Latinas, when I was growing up, I didn't know the work of the US government in international development or the work of organizations like mine, Catholic Relief Services. I stumbled upon international development work when I applied for a job as the director of a large US government aid project in El Salvador. It was there that I saw how US foreign policy interests are advanced, not just by diplomats or embassies or the military, but also by professionals who respond to disasters like the most recent earthquake in Haiti, in which my organization, CRS, and USAID have teamed up to provide emergency relief. International aid organizations like mine help farmers in East Africa mitigate the effects of climate change so they can increase their income. We provide young people in Central America with employment opportunities so they are not forced to migrate. Organizations like mine, CRS, are the implementing partners of US government aid. We work hand in hand with USAID and other government agencies to ensure that international and humanitarian aid reaches the most vulnerable and delivers impactful results that can help the world's poor transform their lives. Yet it's really important to point out that one of the major issues facing international development organizations like mine is the low levels of diversity among staff, particularly in leadership positions. If we look at the leadership of American organizations who work in international aid, Latinos make up only 5% of individuals in leadership roles. If we look at diversity statistics overall, 84% of the leadership of these American aid organizations is white. These are organizations who are implementing billions of dollars of US government funding to countries that are identified as the most strategic for our foreign interest. Yet, as Latinos, we're just not at the table. This lack of diversity greatly limits our ability to be successful as a community. We all know the research. Organizations with diverse leadership make smarter decisions and are more effective. We need diverse people at the table who come from different backgrounds and have varying perspectives, whose unique insights can inform complex US policy decisions. This is particularly true when we talk about US foreign policy and international development in Latin America. As Latinos, many of us understand the context that drives the corruption, the migration, the poverty in Latin America, and we can bring a unique perspective. We can bring insights and cultural competency when development policies and aid dollars are being decided upon. But we need to be at the table. As a Latina, my organization's work in Honduras is it's strengthened because I'm bilingual, I'm bicultural, and I know the history of this region. I am more effective in my role. At the same time, an important challenge for me and for other Latinos and Latinas in international development is not to allow ourselves to be pigeonholed, to only be seen as experts for Latin American issues. We can best serve our Latino community when, when we are omnipresent in leadership positions and not only focus on Latino or Latin American issues. This is especially true because foreign policy, US international aid, they are inextricably intertwined with the domestic policy issues that we as Latinos care about so much. The true empowerment of our Latino community comes when we hold high level leadership posts, when we are influencing and making decisions that have an impact on entire organizations or on our entire government. To reach those positions of influence and have real representation, it's been important for me to make sure that I cannot be pigeonholed as somebody only wanting or willing to work in Latin America. I recently spent three years as the CRS head of programming in Uganda. It was a wonderfully enriching personal experience for myself, for my husband, for our three children, but also professionally incredibly enriching. It allowed me to be seen within my organization as someone capable of leading our work globally, not just in El Salvador or Honduras. I'm also proud to put a new face on what it means to be Latino and American leadership 
it's wonderful to walk into a meeting with Ugandan government officials and show a Latina face as the face of America. Like our peers and in the US government and in corporate America, we at CRS have a long way to go to be more diverse at our leadership levels. Our organization is making important changes and strides and we are getting there. At the same time as Latinos and Latinas, I encourage all of you to think about international development work and humanitarian assistance as sectors where we as Latinos and Latinas can get more involved, that we can wield influence, shape the future of our country and represent our communities, all while working towards peace and development and prosperity for the world's most vulnerable communities. I'm grateful to CHCI for this opportunity to share my experience with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aide Diaz, for your comments. So before Aide's uh, presentation, I left a question. We're about just to go into the Q&A session. So uh, for the audience, you can still send your questions through the uh, chat box you have there and I'll be reading them in just a few minutes. But let's answer this question, which is very important. Let's think, we recruited well, how do we retain the Latino talent in the foreign service? Uh, Ambassador, Haiti, what do you think? Well, I think, uh, uh, Javier, that uh, this is a management issue. Re retention is a management issue. It's a mid-level manager. And when you speak to the people who have left, they've kind of felt that uh, perhaps they weren't being listened to, etc. I think probably, uh, or they weren't able to make the impact that they thought they could when they joined. And I think the issue is twofold. Number one, you've got to pay your due to be able to be considered seriously uh, in any kind of organization, particularly in the State Department. Uh, you got to get your expertise. You got to. You've got to be. You got to have your brief down pat, and then people start listening to you. In fact, one of the things that I did that uh, as Assistant Secretary that they've moved you more of is a hundred or three hundred and sixty degree evaluations. In other words, you don't evaluate an officer unless you evaluate those people who work for him as well as his colleagues and his supervisors, a 360 degree uh, evaluation. I think mid-level officers need to be held accountable to the voices that, uh, that they have at the conference table, people who are working for them in terms of incorporating their thoughts in, in, in terms of listening, number one, and that's happening. Uh, we've never been great at management at the State Department, but there has been a really, a really good focus over that and i think a lot more people will stay in terms of retention we've studied that and uh there are no greater numbers of minority and women leaving the service than white officers but of course their numbers are so much smaller javier that when they do leave you feel it of course um haiti do you, do you agree that it's a management issue that should be tackled that some changes have to be made I think there are some uh, multifaceted issues. Uh, I think, you know, the ambassador pointed out when you speak to folks who are leaving, we don't institutionalize that. We don't take a look at why people are leaving and, and formalize that as part of the exit process for the State Department. I think we did and take a look at that a little bit more analytically. Um, it would be um, great, provide some great insights for the department. I also think we don't really include or value EEO values in our evaluations process. And if we did, maybe we'd see some more changes internally in terms of people staying because they felt it'd be more transparent or the process would um, would value those those um, EEO values that we think are, are important. Perfect, now let's go to Q&A. Let's see what questions did we get. So, First question, and this connects with what Aide was saying about being the face of America in Uganda, for example. This question says, uh, does your presence in other countries as Latinos ever surprise people abroad or disprove their assumptions about who Americans are? Um, I think that one of, the, one of the marvelous things about this country is that no matter who you go into, uh, foreign in terms of foreign leader, from the president all the way down to a sub-minister of cabinet, 
when that person sees you walk into the room, they know you represent the United States of America, that you are a diplomat, and that there are thousands, if not millions, of that country's people living in your country, so that you have an understanding through the people who have who are living from that country country that's living in the United States. And some of these people are very vocal uh, in terms of being, you know, kind of a interest groups inside the United States. So you don't walk, walk in cold. These people know that. Uh, and it's a source of, a source of real strength. Uh, now, are they surprised to see uh, uh, darker complected people or Hispanics or uh, African Americans or uh, anybody else walk through? Yes. But as I said, uh, you get an advantage, I think. Uh, one of the things, if, if you're not convinced of this, there's a behavioralist by the name of Steve Johnson. And Steve Johnson has done an incredible amount of work compares, comparing homogeneous decision-making groups and heterogeneous decision-making groups. Every single study that he has done with, with engineers, and scientists who influences comes out that the more diverse the group, the better the decisions. And uh, and and these are blind tested by uh, by jurors from the field without knowing who's in the group. It is it is demonstrable. But we need to get those people. We need to get Hispanics in particular. At all. Okay. Uh, now uh, we have this question. This is about current issues says, uh, what do you see as the future of American diplomacy in Afghanistan? Uh, either of you want to answer this question? I think it's, uh, everybody's asking this question now. Ah, and Ambassador, they're asking about your podcast, but we, we, we will go to that in a, in a minute. Okay, okay now, but please uh, give us your insight on Afghanistan. Uh, Haiti or, or me? You choose. Doesn't... Now we're in an open session of questions okay. and answers. Okay. Uh, well, I think that uh, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, I think that uh, the United States has uh, a lot more cards to play than we did uh, before as the ally of the Ghani government uh, or the Karzai government before that uh, to uh, trying to support a government, uh, a national government and a federal government in Afghanistan is a hard, if not impossible task. We know that now, uh, but we have a lot more cards to play with the Taliban. We've got their, their, their reserves in the United, in U.S. banks, in European banks. Uh, I think there's uh, close to 20 or $30 billion that are frozen. Uh, the country lives 70% on grants. Those grants are frozen. Uh, they need to have uh, uh, bank transfers, electronic bank transfers. The United States plays the greatest role in the. Uh, it's easy to arm uh, militias and others against the Taliban. Man knows this. Uh, it is hard to govern Afghanistan. I think that we have lots of cards to play. I'm waiting for us to play those cards. Uh, human rights, women's rights to be front and center. I am trying to get a woman out who was, was on our show uh, uh, the end of July. Uh, it's been really, really hard to get her out just to understand what the, what the criteria is uh, by the State Department. She's a, uh, an SIV, a special in, uh, immigrant visa. She's got the okay, but it's been chaotic to try to figure out what the State Department needs by way of documentation, etc. But I think the West has a lot of cards to play. I'm hoping that uh, humanitarian assistance will continue to flow. The UN assistance, relief assistance will continue to flow. There's been talk about um, uh, reaching famine dimensions and proportions by the end of this year in Afghanistan. We all hope that that doesn't happen, but it's going to require a lot of U.S. diplomacy working with our Western allies, working with uh, uh, Afghanistan's neighbors to craft a policy to get move in the right direction vis-a-vis -vis human rights, women's rights, etc. And this is why we all need to listen to your podcast, Ambassador. So here they're saying, tell us more about, tell us more about your podcast. Where, where can we find it? You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, all of your, your, uh, your cast sites on your 
your on your phone. You can find it uh, at our website. It's uh, amdip a m d i p stories uh, dot org o r g. Uh, we've got two hundred and twenty five episodes, almost uh, half a million downloads, and what differentiates us from other very very excellent uh, uh, podcasts on foreign policy is tell stories. Our narratives are our diplomats and telling stories about what they do, how they do it, the, the, the successes, the failures, the setbacks, the, the victories. And it's a very, very personal and it illuminates what it's like to work uh, overseas as a diplomat or development specialist uh, or uh, any of our specialties, what we call cones. And uh, it's a unique podcast. You can't find it anyplace else. American Diplomat. Amazing. You have new followers today. Um, <laughs> so. Haiti, we have this question from the audience. It says, what advice would you give a young Latino who wants to enter this field? Um, I would say definitely learn about what the Foreign Service in entails. Um, well, the field of international affairs is one thing, but really looking at, if you're looking at development work, uh, IDES, obviously in the nonprofit sector, it's a little bit different. And then when you look at government, foreign, the Foreign Service, um is um is its own sort of career um I, when i joined i didn't know if i would be in this for the long run you know i said i would do it until um, i didn't enjoy it and so far you know 14 years in i'm still enjoying it um different challenges um in in different tours um i i learn constantly right whether it's um on the on the job the issues or whether you're learning a language Um, building new relationships. Um, I was able to work in the department on the secretary's staff, which was uh, entailed traveling with him, which was fascinating um, to have sort of that, that perspective and see how policy is made or implemented and executed. Um, it was grueling, but I think one of my favorite jobs so far in the department for a variety of reasons. But so I would say definitely take a look at, at what the foreign service entails. Take the the tests and and open up opportunities for yourself if you're interested i highly encourage people to take a look um and and knowing that what's available um online in terms of you know uh, videos and access to people um there's no shortage of, of resources for people to sort of learn firsthand of what the forest service entails because you shouldn't go in blind you should know some of the challenges like moving every couple of years um depending on what your family needs what you are looking for Um, be an advocate for yourself in this process, even before you enter uh, foreign affairs. Thank you so much, Heidi. I hope this message was directly uh, for someone who needed to listen to this message today. So let's start to wrap up this uh, conversation. Uh, I want to hear your final ideas. Uh, what do you think about the future of American diplomacy? Um, Hispanics are continue are going to continue to be the the one of the biggest groups here in the demographics. So, what do you think about Latinos and American diplomacy? Is the future uh, promising, um, Ambassador? Your final thoughts. Thank you, Javier. And this has been a terrific panel. Haiti, uh, you've been terrific, and it's been a real pleasure to be on it. I guess probably more than anything else, uh, Javier, what I would say is that we are moving days where the country is reevaluating who we are and what we what we we need to do. Afghanistan and what happened will will stimulate that discussion. And at the end of the day, we are going to have to decide as a nation that we're going to put more resources uh, and more focus on diplomacy. We're not going to be able to rely on military fixes. It, obviously, it does not work. Uh, we have to rely on our own diplomacy, our men and women in diplomacy. And this is, I can't think of a better time Uh, to get into this field. And um, lastly, I would just remark that uh, a college professor of mine had a, a, a human beings on the face of the earth should look at themselves as not just owners of the present or whatever, but as stewards, passing the baton, taking the baton from the previous generation, passing it on to the next generation, trying to do the best you can to make this world a better place and to, and to leave it better than you found it, whatever it might be. We're stewards. We're just here temporarily.
early to just better than we found it. It's been what our ancestors have done and what we need to do and what we need to pass on. And I would, I would, I would say, I would issue that challenge that there is no greater place to do that than in the U.S. diplomatic service today. Great. Um, Heidi, your final thoughts. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to follow the ambassador. I'll definitely be following your uh, podcast. Um, and, you know, I would say, um, you know, we're at a, a, a pivotal point in uh, for our country, for foreign affairs. It'll be interesting to see how things mo move forward. I think, you know, <clears throat> I participated in this um, Harvard executive program over the last year virtually. And one of the questions is, you know, where do you see diplomacy going? How do you see that, you know, evolving and developing? How should we be? Uh, engaging or changing and adapting. And I think it's a question we'll constantly ask ourselves, um, definitely in the State Department and in general, and, and for those of us who work in foreign affairs. So I encourage, you know, young folks to take a look at this career because we can't change without new people and fresh insights. Um, and and I think one of the things that I would, I would leave um, members with is uh, for those looking to join is to, you know, do what you enjoy. I think some of us, um, you know, don't take an opportunity to really look at, at the jobs out there. And I think if you um, do a job that you really enjoy, then that also comes across um, in terms of the quality of work that you do. And I've learned that in the Foreign Service in terms of taking jobs. It's sometimes it's not about, you know, what how I can get promoted, but rather what will I really enjoy doing. Um, seek out mentors. So whether that's if you're still in college or you're, you know, looking to make a change that if you don't seek out those mentors uh, yourself, that somebody's not going to come up to you and say, hey, can I be your mentor? Right. Sometimes most of the time it's you developing those kinds of relationships. And I think it's, it's beneficial regardless of of where you are or in, in what kind of job you're doing. And lastly, as I mentioned, just be your own advocate um, in terms of moving up and, and seeking out those resources and, and being able to do that. So um, I think that's that's the what I, I would leave the audience members with and and where we will be in diplomacy. You know, we need you. And I think it's, it's, it's a question that I think we ask ourselves as well. So it's a fascinating time given the changes technologically and, and in foreign affairs on um, what's happening worldwide. And a fascinating uh, topic to discuss. Um, it's been uh, it's been quite a pleasure, an honor, un honor de verdad estar aquí. Heidi Servin Baez, thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Ambassador Peter Romero. It's been great to talk to you and to meet you. Gracias. Thank you for being here, and thank you also Aide Aide Diaz, who was with us as a third panelist. Thank you so much. I just want to stay with a couple of ideas. From this panel the first one is that the more diverse is a table the best decisions out of the table the second idea is that latinos we are also the face of america thank you uh, for attending the congressional hispanic caucus institute leadership Con conference please keep tweeting and sharing your thoughts with the hashtag chcihhm21 make sure to to check out the plenary session up next title immigrants we get the job done and yes we get it done thank you so much have a great day